Good afternoon. Let me see. Yeah. <laughs> How do you I can see? So. No. I think we're all here. That was good. Uh, we're now going to focus on America's economic challenges on the domestic front. In particular, the challenge of expanding opportunity for all Americans. Addressing this challenge is a core principle of our work at the George W. Bush Institute. Within the Bush Institute SMU Economic Growth Initiative, I lead our Blueprint for Opportunity program, aimed at expanding opportunity and economic mobility throughout our country. We're especially focused on the goal of making cities and towns into stronger engines of opportunity, because it's clear that where a person lives powerfully influences their prospects in life. We also focus on cities because they're laboratories of democracy, offering all kinds of lessons on what's working and what's not. I'm honored to be moderating a conversation with two of our nation's most respected thought leaders on this subject, Speaker Paul Ryan and Professor Edward Glazer. Paul Ryan represented Wisconsin in the U.S. House of Representatives for two decades. From 2015 to 2019, he served as the 54th Speaker of the House. Before that, he served as Senator Mitt Romney's vice presidential nominee in 2012. During his service in Congress, Speaker Ryan spearheaded efforts to promote economic opportunity, advance free trade, reform our nation's tax code, and address America's spiraling national debt. Since leaving Congress, he's become a professor of practice at Notre Dame, a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and a board member of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. He's also established the American Idea Foundation in his hometown of Janesville, Wisconsin, founded on what he calls the simple but profound premise that the condition of your birth should not determine the outcome of your life. Speaker Ryan also this year became a partner in the private equity firm Solomir Capital. Ed Glazer is the Fred and Eleanor Glimp Professor of Economics at Harvard University, where he's taught since 1992. Dr. Glazer is widely known as the world's leading scholar on the economics of cities. He's published dozens of major papers on economic growth, education, innovation, and other issues facing cities in our own country and around the world. In 2011, he published one of the most influential books on cities ever, Triumph of the City, how our greatest invention makes us richer, smarter, greener, healthier, and happier. A warm welcome to you both. Thank you. I'd like to start by asking you Thank both. You. A... Ed? Thank you, he said. Ah, good, yeah. Thank you. There's a little bit of a delay. It's uh, going to take me a little bit of time. To... It makes me, I was, we were agreeing, it makes me seem kind of slow-witted as he. Uh... Uh, I'd like to start by asking you both about what America should be aspiring to when we think about working towards a high opportunity economy. Um, so, Speaker Ryan, uh, let's start with you. Okay. Uh, in your mind, what does success look like? And can you say a little bit about the work you've been doing to advance your vision? Yeah, first of all, Mr. and Mrs. Bush, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Um, my daughter lives right over there in Ware Commons. Um, so, it's a nice neighborhood you got here. <laughs> um, so, uh, what does it look like? Well, so uh, the American Idea Foundation, I, I spent um, a lot of my time on poverty economics, whether from ways and means or when I was speaker. I passed a few discrete laws that I care a lot about that I want to see well executed. And my, our foundation uh, works on executing these laws. Uh, we passed something called the Evidence Act. Um, the Petty Murray and I wrote this law to use data and analytics and RCTs, random control trials, to find the evidence of what works and what doesn't so that we can build, scale, and replicate successful poverty fighting programs. Uh, I got involved in a lot of poverty fights and they became ideological warfare battles. They became stalemates. And my conclusion from years of that was to try and get past the ideological partisan battles and just go with what works. And it was actually a program President Bush started called MICV. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a program for infants that nurses come, nurse practitioner program which you did this. I don't know if you remember this, but um, <laughs> you did a lot, all right? So um, it was like the first version of evidence-based policymaking, and it made a huge difference. So Bush created it, Obama renewed it, and Trump increased it. So it, it made it through all political turbulent seas, and our lesson from that experience was let's do this with, with so much more of what we do in fighting poverty. So our foundation is creating the data bank of all of these solutions and all of this data. I got the idea from Raj Chetty, a guy at Harvard, 
So mm -hmm. the foundation is, is, is creating the data bank so that it's a one-stop shop for any philanthropist, any charity or government that wants to scale a poverty problem, um, they don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, they can find out what works, what doesn't, what's been done, what, what works. And so uh, that and a few other uh, research projects. And then on the grassroots, which COVID has complicated this, I'm trying to get members of Congress out of their cul-de-sac congressional districts and get in the inner cities hmm. and work with the poor. Um, I asked my buddy Bob Woodson to take me around America for a few years, no TV, no nothing, and just teach me about poverty. Because in Janesville, Wisconsin, we have it but it's not the kind that they have in inner city Philadelphia, for example. And it was a magnificent education. I made wonderful friendships. We just lost a friend of mine, Omar Jawar, here in town. Um, and I'm trying to get members of Congress to do that. It, it, especially in the House, you have a district that's fairly homogeneous, typically. Mm -hmm. And we've got to get people to cross traffic, to, to, to break down barriers, and to get to know each other. So that's a big part of our plan which once COVID is done, we're going to start executing on that. So sorry for the long answer. But no, that's, that's an exciting vision. Thank you. Dr. Glazer, let's, let, let's ask you the same question. What does it mean to create a high opportunity economy? And, and can you tell us some maybe recurring themes in your work that help us understand how to get there? Of course. And again, thank you for having me there. And, and I'm really uh, thrilled to be part of this conversation. A high opportunity economy is one in which any child has the chance to change the world for the better. To create a product that is sold to millions, to write a book that brings hope and wisdom, even to become Speaker of the House of Representatives. <laughs> in my work, I have always pushed a simple mantra for economic development in cities. Attract and train smart people and then get out of their way. The same thing is true at the country level, and come to think of it for universities as well. It's from Harvard. Individuals, <laughs> cities, and countries rise and fall based on their level of human capital. But our PISA math scores are significantly below the OECD average and below where they were in 2003. Despite the fact that the US spends more than any other large country on our education. But the truth is, we don't really know what will fix America's schools. And I want to emphasize just how much I agree with Speaker Ryan's call for the need for more experimentation and randomized controls trials. When it comes to starting a new business, the World Bank's Doing Business Report ranks the U.S. 55th in the world. Hmm. Federal, state, and local rules like state occupational licensing put the brakes on American ingenuity. And the outrageous thing is that those regulations do far more to limit the entrepreneurship of the poor than they do to limit the entrepreneurship of the rich. If you want to start your internet phenomenon in your Harvard College dorm, you could have a billion users, right, and possibly have changed an election before any regulator knows you exist. <laughs> if you want to start your grocery store, Right? Five blocks away, there are 15 permits that you need to get started. Right? And one of the reasons why so much American talent has focused on cyberspace over the past 30 years is that the internet has been so lightly regulated. The unfortunate side effect is that, of that is the dearth of ordinary jobs for those ordinary Americans who live and work in the real world. Thank you. Well, let's follow up on that with you, Speaker Ryan. Uh, little what he said, I totally agree with everything. <laughs> yep, me, me too. Um, okay, this is maybe a complex question, but I'm betting that you can boil it down for us. Uh, in a nutshell, how are we doing at creating an opportunity-rich economy here? Uh, I'm actually bullish because of technology and, and some new ideas that are coming online. Um, I'm a happy warrior, glass half full type of guy to begin with. I just don't think life's fun being dour. So um, the pandemic hit us pretty hard. I'd say pre-pandemic, we had just started some policies that I think were starting to take root. Um, the bottom two income quintiles were seeing really fast wage growth. Our poverty rates were heading in the right direction. Our unemployment rates were heading in the right direction. Living standards and productivity were looking pretty good. And it's basically what, what, what Dr. Glazer said, which is we had light regulations that were starting to take hold, and we had a pro-growth tax code that was encouraging investment and, and jobs and we were bidding up wages. So we were beginning to see some real good seeds planted, and then we got whacked with this pandemic. Um, my worry is 
Now we'll go back and over-regulate and raise barriers to capital going. I'm a big fan of place-based um, reforms. I think we, you know, we'll probably get up into talking to that. I put opportunity zones in the tax bill, right. Tim Scott's bill. Uh, my foundation works on that as well. And I think there are a few things that are out there that can really pay off if we allow these ideas to really germinate and take hold. And then there's just a lot of good technology. The, it's, Peter Thiel, I don't know if you ever have him come here. He's, there are people in Silicon Valley who are clearly worried about passing over the country with technology and displacing and disrupting workers. But if we put our minds toward applying this technology to careers and fields so that workers aren't not only displaced, but get new ideas, new careers with lifelong learning and the right proper incentives, then I really think we can bring some, some, some great careers. We're, we're working really hard at this and doing fairly well in Wisconsin on this. So I think there are great economic development, great poverty solutions that are, that are out there. Um, and I think we're beginning to test these ideas and I think we'll, we'll start paying dividends if we don't screw up the macro policy in the meantime. It's a big if. Uh, Dr. Glazer, let me ask you a similar question about how we're doing. And you've said, and I've been a big reader of your works, you've said that America's economy, in particular our cities, increasingly protect the interests of incumbents and insiders at the expense of newcomers in a lot of ways in areas like education and, and business. For example, the whole issue you're just ta we're talking about, about occupational licensing of the poor. You've also just written an op-ed this week in the New York Times that applies this idea to the idea of housing. Can you expand on this idea about insiders versus newcomers and tell us where we're going wrong? So this stuff really comes from uh, Manker Olson's classic, The Rise and Decline of Nations. Great book. Where he wrote that, I'm quoting here, in stable societies with unchanged boundaries, they tend to accumulate more collusions and organizations for collective action over time. And these cabals of insiders increase the complexity of regulation, the role of government, and the complexity of understanding, and, and slow down a society's capacity to adapt new technologies. Consequently, they reduce the rate of new economic growth. He was writing in 1982, and his examples were pre-Thatcher England and Tokugawa Japan. When I read this book in the early 1990s, I didn't think it said much about America. We had just had 12 Republican years, mostly rejecting such regulation. Sure, some of the older parts of America might have become rigged by insiders, but there was always unfettered opportunity somewhere in this country. But 30 years later, I, I think Olson was a visionary. I, I see around me, in setting after setting, groups of insiders who have rigged the game against outsiders. You brought up housing, which is my core topic area, and in America's most expensive housing markets, city after city, town after town, they've erected rules that make it harder and harder to build ordinary homes for ordinary Americans. In suburbs, these rules are allegedly justified by environmental concerns, although actually most of the time they tend to increase carbon emissions. But really, I think they just serve to protect incumbent homeowners from the inconvenience of new construction and reduce the chance of, of housing becoming more affordable. Who pays the cost? The young. Whoever would like to move to Silicon Valley but can't afford a $3 million starter home. In the 1980s, plenty of young people had real equity in their homes. You're gonna find far less of that today. As you mentioned, in labor markets, we've had a dramatic rise in state-specific occupational licensing for interior decorators and florists and jobs that pose few, if any, conceivable health risks to customers. Those licenses make it harder to move across states and to move across occupations. We have rules that prevent food trucks in places like Detroit of all places, which should be saying yes to any entrepreneur from competing with existing restaurants. Empowered public sector unions protect bad teachers and even cops who kill. And they arrange contracts where earnings, especially pension payments, go to the workers who've been part of the system for the most years. And our national government has not entirely unfairly been described as a pension system with an army. <laughs> because its benefits skew so strongly towards the old and against the young. That's good. <laughs> but the crucial thing is to stop the young from a tit-for-tat, zero-sum game approach to politics. The young see the generosity of Medicare for the old, and so they demand debt forgiveness for college, no matter how rich your parents are. This is the wrong answer. The right answer is to break the bonds that, that fetter outsiders and stop them from changing the world. Would you like to comment? That is awesome. Um, you know, I just... Uh, <laughs> 
I had that book on my bookshelf the first day I entered a Congress to the last day I entered a Congress. Mansur Olson, The Rising Decline of Nations. It's a spectacular work. I voted for Doug Elmendorf to be CBO director, even though he was a Democrat, because he came from the University of Maryland, because he quoted Mansur Olson. He knew how to get me. I'm like, okay, I'm for this guy. <laughs> um, so, totally agree. Try being in Congress. I mean, um, you see regulatory capture up front, and you basically hedge trim. You just try and trim the hedges back, and then they kind of grow back. I think a better answer these days, because just, I'll give you a quick answer. Regulatory sandboxes is the new thing that I think gives us opportunity and a, and, and a p potential of fixing some of these things. You've got digital you know, assets coming online, crypto and all these things. Creating regulatory sandboxes, I think, is one way in which you can break down um, this regulatory capture, which is in this modern democracy, this, 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 this older democracy is just, it's, it's pretty ugly. And it's more local, frankly, than the national in many instances. You can define regulatory sandboxes for yourself. So you basically take a sector and you say, we're gonna give you the ability to innovate uh, free from, re from, from, from regulation um, with, with real people. So let's just take, I mean, it's the crypto crowd that talks about this a lot, but there are other ways of doing this. Let's take new technology and the regulators in charge of this area allow you to go and experiment and, and try new ideas free from regulation to test your ideas to see if they work and then how to properly provide rules and guardrails so that the, the ecosystem, the economy can, can continue. Because what happens is you regulate too much you don't understand, the regulators don't understand what they're regulating, and they're regulating in the past, looking through a rear view mirror, and you stunt innovation, you erect barriers to entry, and you disallow um, would-be competitors and disruptors from entering a marketplace. That's the problem. Interesting. I'd like to ask you both about cities. Dr. Glazer, let's start with you. The pandemic has obviously put a lot of stress on large cities with the rise of remote working and what seems like a large um, out migration of people from places like New York City and San Francisco. Uh, you've predicted that it might continue to be a tough decade ahead for, for some of America's largest cities. Why? So I, I have no doubt that city life will come back. We are a social species that craves the company of other people. And I think this year of isolation has only made that more obvious. Every time, uh, society opens up every time the regulations eased, young people rush to be back near each other. That shows the enduring demand for being with each other in real life, not just in cyberspace. <clears throat> Cities are also about learning. And uh, yes, call center workers are just as productive when they go home, but they stop getting promoted. They stop learning new skills because they're unable to learn from the people around them. Microsoft tells us that their programmers is just as productive at home as they are at work, but online postings to hire new programmers were down by 40% in November relative to February of 2020. You can coast on old relationships over Zoom, but it's pretty hard to start something meaningful. I, I can advise my old graduate students over Zoom. I have no idea how to get a 19-year-old excited about mathematical economics over a Zoom lecture. <laughs> Um, before Zoom, tech companies were sending people home. Were, were not sending people home. They were buying the Googleplex. They were trying to make their companies fun places to work 24/7. And for 20-somethings, working from a damp, from working in a cramped, dark apartment isn't heaven. It's that other place down below. Mm -hmm. They want to be back around real people, both where they're having fun and when they're working. So I think that face-to-face -face contacts and the cities that empower that contact are here to stay. But at the same time, individual cities have never been more vulnerable. It has never been easier to relocate a tech company from mm. San Francisco to Austin or for a bank to move from Wall Street to Miami Beach. And so I fear a replay of the 1970s when fit footloose companies interacted with highly progressive urban politics to push New York City to the brink of bankruptcy. There is a lot of hunger in urban America for redistribution. And yet when a city treats its businesses and its wealthy residents like they're two piggy banks, then they just up and leave. And after the chaos, after the crisis of the 1970s, cities took a while, but they came back to pragmatic mayor managers and they hopefully will do so again. But I fear we are in for a bumpy ride 
when the desire to fix every wrong at the social level collides with the reality that Zoom has made us more able to relocate than ever before. Speaker Ryan. I would add to that. So in tax reform, our biggest pay for that we believed in and still do to this day was, was capping the state and local tax deduction, SALT. And we, Kevin Brady, who one of the best guys in Congress, just announced his retirement yesterday because his chairman, his head of the Ways and Means Committee, he followed me into that job, just is ending at the end of this term. We tried limiting the whole thing. We couldn't do that because of the votes, so we kept it at $10,000, which basically takes care of a middle class, middle income um, taxpayer. But SALT is, with, with a 15% tax rate, which I think is what New York State has put in place now, is accelerating this trend. So I think, I can't, I can't top what Ed just said about cities, but I think you're gonna see a difference between cities like New York that do not appreciate jobs, creators, businesses, and say cities like Dallas or in Florida. Um, so you're gonna see a big migration um, based on cost and quality of government, entrepreneurship. Uh, the day we passed that tax reform bill with assault, and they're trying to replace it, but I, I don't know if they'll get that done. Uh, Tim Cook called me that day we passed it. He said, I am now repatriating, um, I think it was $40 billion at the time of money we have overseas mm -hmm. because you guys changed the way the tax system. And I'm going to hire 20,000 people in America somewhere. That somewhere is in Austin, Texas. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't think he was going to put not, that up in California. Not Cupertino. That's, that's in Austin, Texas. So um, I, think, I, think, I think policies make a difference in, on urban trends. I think you're going to see the states, the cities that have, have it right are going to win, especially since SALT has been repealed and, effectively. And how do the challenges facing cities look from the point of view of places in the, in, in the heartland like Janesville? Well, I mean, our, our cities, we don't have the SALT problem like these, like Illinois and, and New York and California have. Uh, our challenge is just economics. It's just, it's just we're losing old line manufacturing and we've got to find good replacement jobs for that. That's basically our Milwaukee problem, our, our problem in the heartland, is finding good replacement jobs that replace careers and getting ahead of it. Now, we've got a plan. We're attacking it. And in, in, in Milwaukee, frankly, I think we're doing all right. So let's follow up on that. President Biden has a jobs plan. Um, uh, and as you know, uh, President Biden is proposing a roughly $2.7 trillion, depending on how you count it, uh, spending plan focused on physical infrastructure and lots of other things including digital connectivity, sustainable energy, and many, many more things. Could you tell us what you think America's public investment priorities should be? Um, Speaker Ryan, start. Not this. Uh, look, I could tee off for a while here, but I won't. Uh, about a third, let's just be generous. A third of that bill is what you would consider actual infrastructure. The other two-thirds of the spending is grab bag coalition spending that the progressives have had a pent-up list that they want to fund. It has next to nothing or nothing to do with infrastructure. The biggest concern I have is the pay-fors. Um, they're basically taking our, our business tax code, our corporate tax code. Uh, obviously, I've spent most of my career on this in this part of law. We were, were, the, we were the worst tax code uh, in, in 2015 in the world. And now we're one of the better ones since 2017. All this repatriation has occurred. The, the wages have increased. There are no more inversions, and they're taking us back to worst again, literally the worst business tax code. You will turn inversions back on. You will lower productivity. You'll lower plant investment. That means you'll lower wages. You'll lower living standards for a spending package of which one out of $3 of its claimed infrastructure go to actual infrastructure. So do we need infrastructure? Yes. Are there lots of high-tech infrastructure that need to go to, to blighted areas? Yes. Um, are there better ways of paying for it that you could get Republicans to, to do? Yes, and they chose not to do that. He had a, a great shot in COVID to make it bipartisan. They, they reconciled it and didn't do that. On this bill, frankly, I think you should get rid of the gas tax and replace it with the vehicle miles, uh, VMT, we call it. Because, I mean, electronic vehicles are not just rich people cars anymore. They're cars that are going to become more affordable. They don't pay gas taxes. They still ride on roads, though. So there, you could replace this dinosaur revenue um, source gas taxes with a better one that is actual user friendly, user fee based, and have more money for transportation, real transportation, and you could get a whole bunch of Republicans to support doing that. They've chosen to, to go this better, this other route, and uh, so I just don't. I think they, I think they whiffed again. 
on a real shot at a bipartisan package. So Dr. Glazer, your perspective. You chair the National Bureau of Economic Research Infrastructure Task Force, I believe, currently. What do, what do you think it means to create 21st century economic infrastructure in cities and to pay for it in a reasonable way? Well, I think it starts with the, with the principle that infrastructure be, should be largely funded by its own users. There's no reason why taxpayers in Wisconsin should pay for subways in, in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, and the basic principle of a vehicle miles tax is a good one. Um, infrastructure needs to be maintained well, but ideally at a low cost. Private provision can help with that in some circumstances. In infrastructure needs to be evaluated using rigorous cost-benefit analysis. And that analysis needs to focus overwhelmingly on the benefits to the users themselves, not to ancillary benefits for the larger economy or because a, a monorail will somehow or other bring Detroit back. Um, in terms of the physical infrastructure in play, it's hard to know. There's an old joke that 40 years of transportation economics at Harvard can be boiled down to four words, bus good, train bad. <laughs> And there's a lot to like about the low cost and flexibility of the bus. And if I were thinking about the right way to connect Milwaukee and Chicago in 2030, I would guess an autonomous bus driving on a dedicated lane at 130 miles an hour sounds a lot more financially sustainable than traditionally heavy rail. But I think the larger principle is just being open to innovation, being aware to the barriers which make it far more expensive to build infrastructure in the US than it should be, and uh, rigorously focusing on taking steps so that we make sure that we build project that delivers value to ordinary Americans. Okay. Speaker Ryan, I've got, I've got to ask about the national debt. Uh, we're obviously adding to it at a rapid clip, and it seems that there is a growing chorus of voices that are arguing we really shouldn't worry about it. How concerned should Americans be? I'm really worried about this. Uh, we had four last year, and we're adding 2.3 this year, trillion. Uh, my worry is we're not acting like a, a, a reserve currency country should act, and if we keep it up, we're going to lose that privilege, and that will jeopardize the social contract, and that will bring enormous social upheaval in this country. Um, I'm proud of the fact that when we were in the majority, we, in the House, passed a budget every term that not only balanced the budget, and, but paid off the debt. It takes years to do that, but we moved the retirement age. We did premium support for Medicare. We took all those tough votes, all those third rail things, and we did it for eight years out of the House, but we could never find a partner in the Senate, or let alone a president, to do that. So. I think we've demonstrated you can take these tough positions, take these votes, and still survive. Um, so I, I don't think this is as third rail as, they used, as, as it has been claimed. That's point number one. Point number two, this notion that you can just QE forever, this notion that debt and deficits don't matter, is really an ideology in search of justification by grabbing a patina of an economic doctrine, which has no, 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 no fact, no basis, no... It, the laws of economics and mathematics still exist and persist. So that's really ideology. And, and the, the, my fear is enough people will, we can't get this together before it's too late. I think digital currencies are going to hasten the time we've got to get our act together and get, get our monetary policy off of its collision course with our fiscal policy and we just accelerated it. The pandemic, that, that was necessary. We had to do what we did. The CARES Act was necessary, but we've got to show the world that we're getting our debt under control by passing the relevant laws that do that over time. And you know, if we actually used you know, the kind of accounting that, 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 that could show that, we could really get ourselves in a good place. We're not doing that. There's no end in sight to this. Uh, my own party is not where it needs to be on this issue. And, um, and, and we're going to lose our reserve currency status if we don't watch it. And that's going to be a really, really ugly time for our country if, if we let that happen. Hmm. That's for sure. Uh, my final question is for both of you. 
the past year has obviously been a tough year for everyone in, in all kinds of ways. And I want to ask you both, what, what have you seen over the past year that most gives you hope for America's economic future, that we can put our house in order? Let's start with you, Dr. Glazer. What gives you hope? You know, I have just seen around me a lot of people who are recognizing what actually matters in life. And in some sense, we were, so many of us, so caught up in, in the, the maelstrom of our lives that we forgot about what really matters. We forgot about taking care of each other. We forgot about our obligations to our community. And that certainly gives me hope. Um, when I think about what we have to do going forward, in some sense, the most important thing is to figure out how to fix American education. The last time I was at the Bush Center, I was a guest of, of Margaret Spellings, with whom I had the honor to serve uh, for many years on the advisory panel of the Gates Foundation. And I think both of us felt a certain uh, you know, frustration with, with the situation. Um, and for me, at least, I boil it down to the view that we need to learn before we need to act. And we really don't know what, fi what will fix education in our cities. And it may well be experimental after-school vocational programs that are competitively sourced, that are paid for performance. But we don't know. And we're at a moment in which we should recognize that it was through using great science that we have vaccines right now. And we will need great social science to figure out how to make American cities once again places of opportunity. And so that chance, that reset, is at least what gives me the most hope. Speaker Ryan, you have the last word. Um, I think the resilience of our economy and institutions surpassed a lot of people's expectations, mine included. The, the rebound of our economy is far better than any economist or modeler expected. Um, warp speed, which shows you the power of ingenuity, innovation, private property rights, free enterprise, and yeah, getting government regulation out of the way, produce a vaccine in record time. So I think the responses and the resiliency and the comeback of the economy is impressive and, and, and gives me hope. And I'm, I, when you get longer in these jobs, and you know, I feel like I'm an old guy in Congress, uh, I became a, a big institutionalist at the end of the day. And I started worrying, I, I worry we're deinstitutionalizing sort of civil society and society, frankly. But our institutions held. Our civic institutions, the separation of powers, were really tested recently. And we held and survived it. And there wasn't really ever a moment, and having been an inside institutional guy, where I worried that they weren't going to hold. But they were really tested and they held. So I'm proud of our system. The founders gave us an incredible system. It's the design of that system is why we are who we are today for many, in many respects. And it held, so it gives me hope. And does that translate into some uh, economic progress that you see ahead? Yeah, I do. I think, I think we're opening up and, and we're just unleashing the animal spirits. We got a recession behind us. And I think provided we don't put really bad fiscal policy in place, I think we're going to have some really good growth. Um, I do worry about inflation and those issues in the out years. Uh, that's a concern I have. I think they're overdoing it on, on the fiscal side. But, but the point being is I think we're going to have really good growth. And we should resume the climb up the ladder of upper mobility and wage increase and, and, and unemployment reductions if we, if we let the economy heal itself. I wish we could carry on this conversation well into the evening. It is so interesting. I, I, I think one key takeaway is that we all need to read Mansur Olson's yeah, it's a uh, great, book. great book, which was on your shelf for Rise and Decline of Nations. I have read it myself, and uh, I recommend it as you all do. Uh, I would suggest that we've had some common threads running through this conversation and the earlier ones today. Uh, the idea that our institutions have held. I think we heard this in the international panel as well. Uh, the idea that we have work to do in creating more opportunity in our economy, but we, we have some pretty clear paths forward if we will just uh, seize them. So uh, on that note, uh, Speaker Ryan, Dr. Glazer, we have been so honored to have you at the Bush Institute. Thank you very much for Thank being you. here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.